Welcome to the final technology and culture seminar of the semester here at Olin College. I'm Debbie Chachara. I teach material science, and I'm extremely pleased to prevent, present my friend Jeff Potter, who will be talking about a topic, actually two topics, that are both near to my heart, food and science, and I suspect near to the hearts of many of the people here. Jeff? So, yeah, um, thanks so much. Uh, words of wisdom about life and in general right now, I should say, check events before you leave. I thought this started at 5.30, so... Uh, Check events before you leave to go do things, and the second thing is always show up half hour early just in case. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know how many of you have seen a copy of this little book, Cooking for Geeks. Um, it came out earlier this year. Um, one guy's got it here. Um, and I, I, if, if you guys are ever thinking about writing a book, um, I would say don't, but actually, um, incredible experience. Um, I can talk plenty about that some other time. Um, but I, I thought I would talk today a little bit about how I came to write this book and then get into some food science stuff. So my background is actually technology. I'm normally in an environment like that, dealing with servers, making like, the internet work. Um, and while not doing this, I was kind of maintained my sanity by cooking for friends at home. So it was just kind of a passion I have to do on the side. So my background is actually computer science, um, not food science. But the two really share a lot in common in terms of how you approach things. When something's not going right and you're trying to debug it, whether it's code or a recipe, your approach is actually essentially the same. You know, figure out what might be going wrong, try to test it, come up with a hypothesis, and then go ahead and you know, see if you can figure out what's actually occurring. Um, so I thought I'd start actually with some Venn diagrams, um, because they're always fun and geeky. Um, you know, people ask me a lot, what's a geek? And there's a Venn diagram for that. Like, I totally love this. This is on the, online somewhere. Someone sent it to me a long time ago. And, like, I wish I could find who did it so I could like, actually put it on the back cover of the book. Um, but I think the important bit here is that geeks are people who are like, curious about how things work and are willing to apply some brain power to actually you know, figure out why it's working that way. Um, same thing's true whether you're in front of a computer, in front of a lab bench, or um, you know, in front of the kitchen. Um, more fun with Venn diagrams. Um, Apple versus Linux versus Microsoft. Um, Somebody made this really cool website. There's a Venn diagram generator. You guys know Google like auto suggest how like you can start typing in like Olin College and like it fills stuff in. So this is like just takes auto suggest for whatever labels you give it and like fills in the Venn diagram of it. Um, and like I, I think it's interesting that you know Apple doesn't actually get the so popular label. And I don't know. I guess people just aren't searching Apple and you know so popular at some point. Um, you can do this with things like you know cooks versus bakers versus geeks. Um, Cooks and bakers wear white. <laughs> Geeks do not wear white. Um, I'm actually not wearing my normal black t-shirt today. I apologize. Um, and geeks like bacon, which you know seems pretty appropriate to me. Um, so you can do this also for things like cooking and science and food. And I think the really interesting bit about this is, well, all three of them are important. And I would certainly agree with that. Um, so kind of with the Venn diagram thing out of the way, um, it is, is kind of amusing. It's fun to look at it. But really, what's going on here is, well, it, it comes down to thinking about how the world works. And this is kind of a fun way of, of seeing how most people think about the way the world works. Um, in a science domain, um, seeing how the world works really comes down to hypotheses, models, and predictions. And so really, this is kind of the, the insight that I hope that you guys can take away from tonight, is that we all have models about the way the world works. You know, if I pick up something and let go, it falls. We have this model, it's called gravity, and we know how that works. Um, but there are different levels of models. So the very simplest model for gravity um, first came up by Aristotle two millennia ago. He suggested that things fall to their natural place. Um, it's a really simplistic model. It doesn't really help you predict things too much, but it's better than no model. Um, fast forward about 2,000 years, you get to Newton, who actually formalized Galileo's work. And you know, he basically wrote down a set of equations that says, hey, here's how gravity works. And this is you know, the model that's actually still taught in today's high school physics classes. Um, and you know, the model of gravity that, that they used back in, in Newton and Galileo's time was pretty good. Um, and it's still actually you know, useful for most purposes today. But it actually famously does not account for Mercury's orbit around the sun. And to actually get an even better model to uh, describe that, you actually have to look at um, Einstein's theory of general relativity to actually get an even better model. But the thing to, keep, to take away from this is that as time goes on, we get better models, and better models make for better predictions. And the same thing is definitely true in the kitchen. Um, and we'll get there in a minute. 
So the other thing I need to kind of say about science uh, is that science really relies on two key things, um, theories and data. So your theories are essentially, you know, a bunch of equations you've got on a whiteboard. They're, they're predictions, they're models, they're equations that say, hey, you know, given these set of inputs, we expect to see these sorts of outputs. And then the other thing on the, on the flip side is actual data, observations, measurements from the real world. And your data from the real world, you know, should hopefully mostly fit your theoretical side. You know, theory without any data is just that. It's a theory. You don't actually know if it's true or not. And data without any theory doesn't actually help you predict new values. You don't have any sort of model to help you understand what's going on underneath all of that. Now, this is certainly true in food. Um, here's an equation to tell when meat is done cooking. I actually can't read this. I don't even know what tensor equations are, but I'm told that there's one in there somewhere. Um, so food definitely has, you know, all the theoretical side. But for me personally, I'm much more of an empirical guy. Like, I like to collect data. I like to go to my kitchen and say, hey, what happens if we do this? Um, and it actually turns out to be a lot easier. So that's kind of a very quick, like, broad brushstroke view of how food science and food kind of applies to science in general. Um, essentially, it's, it's the same set of tools that you would use. You might not just think about it that way normally. So let's start with a simple question. Um, what happens when you cook meat? Like, what's your mental model tell you happens to a piece of meat when you actually cook it? Turns from pink to brown. That's good. It does, hopefully. Well, in some cases. Um, any other guesses or suggestions? Less squishy. So, like, the texture changes. Okay, that's good. Bacteria are bad things in them die, yeah, uh, at some temperature. So these are the beginnings kind of of, you know, some, some models about what's happening with cooking. Um, here's actually some photographs of, from askthemeatman.com, best URL ever. Um, and you can kind of see, you know, as you cook a piece of meat, well, yeah, you know, here's some cross sections, and it starts to change color. It goes from red, and, you know, the heat kind of penetrates in from the top and bottom surface here, so the middle kind of remains pink. Um, what's actually going on in this piece of meat is there's a bunch of different proteins, and those different proteins have different structures, and they denature and cook at different temperatures. So with something like steak, there's actually two proteins that seem to really matter. One's called myosin, and one's called actin. Myosin begins to cook around 122, and actin begins to cook around 150. And as she said earlier, you know, texture changes. Well, when these proteins denature, the texture of that meat tissue also changes. And it happens that we like the texture of myosin proteins denatured and actin proteins native. Like, there's really no particular reason that I'm aware of other than just, well, sometimes you like these textural changes and sometimes we don't. So if you think about medium rare steak, like medium rare steak's like 135, 140 degrees. Like, suddenly you should be getting to think about, like, models about how steak cook and go, wait, 122 myosin, 135. 540 perfect medium rare, like 150 actin. If you're thinking that medium rare steak is essentially myosin protein cooked and actin protein native, well, the data seems to line up with this and suggest that's what's going on. Um, and here's a nice little cross-section photograph of a like, steak tip that I fried up at home. Um, it's like rare in the middle, very rare. But basically, you get the idea that you know, it goes from being like rare to kind of medium rare, medium, medium well done. And you'll see the outside of that is actually turned brown. Um, any guesses why it's turning brown? Name of the reaction? Myer reaction. Myer reaction, yes. I like that, like a lot of things all at the same time. Your students are smart here. Um, so, yeah, exactly. I mean, say what? So, ex no kind of worries. Um, so, so, you know, this, this model of meat cooking, well, it's better than that cell model you would have had a little while ago. You know, essentially, um, that, that meat is actually undergoing a, a chemical and physical change as it heats up. And that's very temperature dependent. And it actually turns out to be ex a really, really important to understand what those temperatures really come down to. Um, so what happens when actin begins to cook, like around 150 degrees? You get this really dry meat. Like, it just is not really delicious. If you think about, like, all those turkey, like, turkey breasts that were just cooked in the last few weeks where, like, the white meat's, like, overcooked and dry, like, that's because the actin proteins got denatured and lost their, like, you know, delicious texture. Um, so not all pieces of meat actually cook this way, though. There are other cuts of meat, uh, something like beef stew or short rib or duck confit that actually seem to be just fine being cooked above 150, where you can actually take them, like, to 175, 180, no problem. They don't get that tough, dry bit. Um, 
So this is kind of that refinement of that, that mental model you might have about cooking meat. You know, this is going a little more complicated than just that, that prior step of myosin and actin protein. Um, in this case, there's actually another molecule that's present in some, well, it's present in meat tissue in general, but uh, the percentage of the meat that's made up of this molecule um, is higher in some cuts of meat. And anyone recognize this molecule? Yeah. <laughs> Her favorite molecule, of course. Um, and I owe a debt of gratitude to many uh, evenings spent over dinner understanding exactly how this molecule works. Um, but yeah, basically this is collagen, and it takes a long time to break down. And it also happens to mask dryness in meats. So if you've got something like duck leg, where it has a lot of collagen in it, and you cook it to like 170 degrees, and those actin proteins are all denatured and dry, well, the collagen that's in there will end up actually masking the presence of that dryness. Um, so figuring that you guys are a bunch of college students, I thought I would actually share a really quick, simple recipe. Um, you get some short ribs. These are things that are high in collagen. You get a slow cooker and you get a bottle of whatever barbecue sauce you like. Put the short ribs in the slow cooker, cover it with um, barbecue sauce, and like come back like six hours, 12 hours later. Like you have to actually give us long enough at time, at temperature, for that collagen molecule to break down. So like the collagen molecule is this really long, like triple helix structure. It's got lots of cross links holding it together. And like it takes a long time for that thing to actually break down. Um, think about like calamari. Um, if you've had like squid, which if you think about it, there's no like structure, like there's no bone structure in something like squid or octopus. That structure is actually provided by the collagen molecule, which is kind of like steel reinforcement. Um, the, the collagen molecule can essentially undergo like, well, two different reactions. And it, so that means it'll be in one of three states, native, um, denatured but not hydrolyzed, or denatured and hydrolyzed. And I suppose technically it can also just be hydrolyzed and not denatured, but I'm going to skip that except for her. Um, so the thing about collagen is that in its native state, it's relatively you know, enjoyable. You can, it, you can chew on it fine. Um, and if it's um, completely cooked, you know, denatured and hydrolyzed, it's also just fine. But if you get an in-between state, it's very rubbery. And um, according to at least one material scientist I know, it is technically rubber at that point. Um, so this is why if you take something like calamari and you order it in a restaurant and like, it's really chewy, well, it's because the collagen molecule is essentially, like it's lost this triple helix structure, but it's still connected together, and it's like springy, just like a piece of rubber would be. Um, you had a question? Uh, yeah, on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it doesn't really matter in this case. As long as you get it above, say, well, we'll just say 150 Fahrenheit for, for simplicity's sake. Um, but basically, if you drop it into the slow cooker, as long as it's hot enough for that collagen molecule to eventually break down, but not so hot that the moisture that's present there is going to boil out, well, it'll cook. So it really comes down to that the temperatures that we deal with in cooking are about getting hot enough for certain reactions to occur, but not too hot for other reactions to occur. Um, so in the case of collagen, you kind of need to give it like 150 to 160 degrees. I mean, there's a little bit of hand weaviness here because you can actually go colder and hold it for a really long time, but essentially, let's just call it 150 and hold it for long enough. So we're talking about models. Um, you know, your really simple model about meat probably says, you know, follow our recipe and just do what it says. Um, but now that you've got a little more food science background, you now can begin to think, wait a second, myosin begins to cook around 122, actin begins to go like around 150, collagen, actually I think it's like 165 to have it noticeably occur. Um, but essentially with this better model, you can now look at a piece of meat and think, right, how should I cook this? You don't have to actually follow a recipe, um, which actually turns out to be incredibly handy. Um, or you can start taking guesses. So let's talk about turkey, since it was just Thanksgiving. Um, the thing about turkey is it's actually kind of complicated to cook because you've got parts of the bird that are low in collagen and parts that are high in collagen, and you're trying to cook them at the same time. But these two different parts of the bird have different levels of proteins in them, and they need to be cooked differently. So this is actually why it's really tough to cook a perfect bird. So I look at this and think, well, the ideal way of cooking something like this is actually cook it separately. Take your turkey leg, cook it like you would cook anything that's high in collagen, take your turkey breast and cook it like anything you would cook that's low in collagen. And it actually it makes it much, much easier. So you know, if you find yourself having to cook Thanksgiving dinner and don't want to be stressed out, don't bother cooking the whole bird at the same time. It's just too much work. Um, so you notice there's a thermometer in there, and it says 162. Um, the standard rule is 165 degrees, actually. So who here has ever cooked chicken? OK, so most of you guys actually are kind of, you know, cook some. How many people are regular cooks who like to cook a fair amount? OK, so yeah, about, about in a half a half of that group. Um, any guesses why 165 degrees? Why you're told, take your chicken breast to 165? 
Food safety. Can you be more specific? Yeah, exactly. Cutting off these guys. Um, that, that, that would be our good friend, Salmonella. Um, the thing is, Salmonella doesn't actually live anywhere near 165. In fact, the highest temperature in the food safety literature for survival of foodborne uh, pathogens is 131 degrees. So these guys are long since dead. Um, and you don't have to just take my word for it. You can actually go to the Food Safety Inspectional Service. This is the group at the USDA that's responsible for telling you what temperature to cook your chicken to. These are the guys that tell you to cook your chicken to 165. They also publish a table at temperature and time. So they also say you can actually cook your chicken at 140 degrees. Perfectly safe. As long as you hold it for 35 minutes in the case of turkey and 26 minutes in the case of chicken. So that food safety rule that you kind of maybe intuitively knew, oh, I'm supposed to cook things to 165, is a very simple model. A little more complicated model is, well, it's not just temperature, it's time and temperature. And it's really about properly pasteurizing things, reducing the number of pathogens that might be present to a level where it's safe. So in the case of something like chicken or turkey, you can cook it lower as long as it holds it long enough. Now, the standard rule in food safety is something called the danger zone. It basically says, don't hold food between 40 and 140 for more than two hours. Because if you do, well, there'll be, there'll be too many pathogens present, and you might get really sick. Um, but the reality of it is that it's not like you know, a square stump function. It's one of these little you know, curves. And it actually turns out salmonella, like ideal brain temperature happens to be like 98 degrees, 99 degrees like body temperature. Um, so the thing to keep in mind is that the rules that we're given are very simple, but if you start looking at the science behind them, um, there are more advanced rules. You don't always have to go with kind of the default simplest rule. So here's that simple model, cook meats to 165. And the better model is, well, you can cook them colder as long as you hold it long enough to properly pasteurize it. So why is this important? Well, once you start having a couple of different models, you can start combining them and doing some really interesting stuff. You can't really get there until you've got at least a few of them to work with. So let's take the two of these models and combine them and think about what that actually could mean in the kitchen. Um, I said earlier that the ideal temperature for something like medium rare steak is like 135 to 140 degrees. It's a really narrow band. You know, warm enough that myosin protein cooks, but cold enough that the actin protein doesn't cook because actin proteins, when cooked, are going to make the meat dry. But if you're supposed to cook your chicken breast to 165, you're also going to cook your actin. So it's going to be a dry, tough piece of meat, but it'll be safe. But what we really want is this really ideal temperature range. So if you drop your chicken or your steak or whatever into an oven, like this is kind of hypothetically what happens. Now, it's not actually a real curve like this. It kind of you know, pauses at certain points where certain reactions occur and absorb energy. Um, but you can kind of work with this, right? So what happens is, in the case of something like steak, we drop it into a really hot environment, and we pull it out at some point. And maybe it carries over a little bit, but then it kind of starts to coast back down. But if you don't time it right, it's going to overshoot and it'll get too hot. So what we really want, ideally, is something that does this, where you put it in an environment and it just can't get above that temperature. And this happens to work. It happens to work great. Um, that piece of meat on the right is cooked that way. And you'll see that the whole thing is medium rare, center to edge. Like, there's no like gradient of done this. There's no but it's overcooked. Like in this piece of meat, like there's a little tiny narrow region that's like texturally perfect. Like the middle is undercooked, outside's overcooked. But this thing, the whole thing, center to edge, is perfect. Any guesses how I did this? <laughs> yep. <laughs> so this is my rig at home. Um, I, it's called, this is a, a unit called an immersion recirculator. It basically takes a body of water and holds it at a really precise temperature. Um, you can do things like eggs in it. Um, the unit I have has like a little water agitator. But basically all this does is it keeps the temperature of that water bath plus or minus, in my case, like maybe half a degree. So it's actually really similar to something like a slow cooker. A slow cooker keeps the temperature within, you know, a relatively wide window, maybe 160 up to 180, and, you know, it kind of swings. All this does is make that window really, really narrow and, like, keep it from going too hot or too cold. Um, and the other thing, of course, is I can set what that temperature is, where with most slow cookers, at least what we have today, you know, you just turn it to low, medium, or high. You can't really set the temperature range. Um, if you're going to cook something like this using a water bath, uh, if you're cooking something like eggs, they happen to come in nice little containers, courtesy of the chicken. 
But if you want to cook something like chicken, well, you could just talk, toss that chicken breast directly into the water and have it kind of float around, which is kind of gross. Um, or you can drop it into a bag and seal it. And you can put like marinade, olive oil, salt, pepper in that bag, other stuff. Um, you can do stuff like lobster tails, um, if you just happen to have some laying around. Um, they actually work really good. Um, one thing in that photograph I showed you a minute ago is you'll notice that it didn't have any Maillard reaction on the outside of it. And that's because that reaction doesn't begin to occur until like 310 degrees Fahrenheit. And if we've got this in a water bath at 140, well, not 310 degrees, that reaction's never gonna occur. So if you see something like, you know, pork chops or whatever that's have a nice brown surface, like by definition you know that that surface got up to 310 degrees under normal conditions, unless you've got like pH modifiers and other things in there. Essentially, you know that it got really, really hot. Um, so something like sous vide, if you want to actually get that nice brown reaction on the outside, you need to drop it into a really hot environment to sear it. So in this case, you know, you might take your steak tip or whatever it is you're working with and just drop it into a cast iron pan. Now, the key thing about sous vide that makes it so incredibly wonderful, and like you should all like go back to your dorm rooms and figure out how to do this, um, is that essentially it separates the two variables of internal temperature and external temperature. And you'll see this come up again later in my talk. Um, when we bake things like a loaf of bread, where you want that, the outside to be nice and brown, and you want the middle to have, well, you know, nice white, you know, foam structure technically, those two things occur at different temperatures. The outside of a loaf of bread needs to get to 310 degrees for that mad reaction in the proteins in the flour to begin to make it brown. And the starches in the middle of that loaf of bread need to get to around to like 205, 210 degrees. These are two separate temperatures. In the case of sous vide cooking, um, what's really nice about it is that you basically split them. Like when you normally cook, you're racing like the inside and the outside temperatures up to like their target temperature, and hopefully you don't get the outside done before the inside's done or the other way around. With sous vide stuff, basically you cook the middle until it's done, then you cook the outside until it's done, which means that you basically can't overcook either part. So here are two more temperatures. Any guesses what 144 and 158 might be? Yeah, probably. <laughs> Nobody? Okay, um, 144 is the temperature at which the first set of proteins and eggs begin to coagulate and denature. And 158 is kind of the upper range at where most of them set. So if you talk about a perfect soft poached egg, this diagram should look familiar. This is how we normally do it. A sous vide application, you'd want something like that. And what you get is something like this, where the yolk and the white are exactly the same texture. Um, the other great thing is, well, going back to this idea that, that the ideal temperature ramp is like right in that really narrow band, like it's never gonna overcook. So you don't have to worry about pulling it out exactly at seven minutes. You can leave it in there for an hour, two hours. You could throw brunch for 48 people and put 48 eggs in and just pull them out when you want them. Like they're not gonna overcook. Another kind of cool thing, most of us think about eggs as having two layers, like a white and a yolk. They actually have seven layers, and one of those layers doesn't set up until a slightly higher temperature. So you can do this, where the egg just kind of falls out of the shell which is actually really cool. No more like having to grab a spoon and like scoop it out if you're doing your soft poached eggs for like, I don't know, breakfast. Um, so how do you do this at your, well, how do you do this at home or your dorm room? Um, actually, I'm gonna ask an obnoxious question. Does Owen have dorms? Okay, just making sure. Um, so, you know, this is the thing I have at home. Um, I bought mine off of eBay a couple years ago and it was like two or $300, which, you know, eh, it's pricey, but you know, I was happy. Um, there are now our consumer units in the market. This is called a sous vide supreme. They're like $450. Um, maybe you guys can afford it. I don't know. I don't think I would have been able to in college. But I bet you could probably do this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So that's a thermostatic controller. Um, all we're doing is interposing on the power supply on a slow cooker. You take that slow cooker, you know, it's got a container that's designed to hold liquid, it's got a heating element, it's UL approved for food, so you know, that problem, there's no problem there. Um, take an extension cord, cut it. Run your thermostatic controller on an extension cord, take your slow cooker and plug it into the extension cord, take a thermocouple and drop it into your slow cooker, and then set your slow cooker to on. <laughs> and make sure you have one that actually is like an on-off switch, because like the digital ones, like if you cut the power and restore the power, like they won't turn back on. So you actually have to get a cheap slow cooker to do this. If you've got like a fancy one, it won't work. Um, so I'm actually gonna pause here for a few minutes and answer any questions you might have. I know I've thrown a lot at you really fast, but I kind of figured that would be fun to kind of, you know, talk about science and models and, you know, eggs. Yes.
Yes, so ceviche, actually, using acids. Um, it's literally denaturing the proteins. The acids in whatever you're using, like lime juice, is literally, on, from an electronic point of view, pushing on the proteins and snapping them out of their native conformation. So things like ceviche or kimchi, you know, vinegar, all, all that kind of stuff would be essentially um, doing the same chemical thing. Um, other questions? Ah, I myself have not, I know a number of people, I've talked to a number of people who have, and they love them. Um, I actually know one person who um, rigged up like a thermostatic controller to theirs and a fan and everything to do the exact same thing for like um, really precise temperature for smoking. So these big green eggs are basically, you know, well, how do you call them? Barbe kilns, barbecues, you know, they're like they're ceramic, like green, like green eggs, so they call them green eggs. Um, yeah, well, do you have one somehow? Yeah. So the thing about things like these big green eggs is that they just have a lot of thermal mass. And anytime you've got a large amount of mass at a particular temperature, it's very sluggish to respond to temperature changes. This is why I always recommend that you should like throw a pizza stone into your oven. So like take an, a wire rack, put it in the lowest setting, throw a pizza stone in there, and then put another wire rack above it, and just pretend like the pizza stone's not there. And all it does is, well, it's more mass in your oven. So when you heat your oven up, it's going to take longer to heat up, but it's also not going to drop as much when you open the door or put your food in. So same kind of concept there. Um, I'll take one more question, and then we'll kind of go on to the next bit. Um, it's actually incredible. Um, I was gonna, I would normally bring stuff and demo it, but I can't right now, unfortunately, because of travel stuff. Um, you can control how much it's set by just varying the temperature, because it's like on the order of like I think it's like 50 or 60 different proteins that all begin to go in that 144 to 158. So like you can cook them at 146 or 147 or 100. Like each degree is going to actually change the texture and make it set up more. So if you're a sort of person who doesn't you know want it runny or not. You can essentially tune how runny it will be. Yeah, all of this is in my book. I'll slip you a 20 later for saying that. <laughs> Including that. Page, 300, page 340. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm joking. So I want to verify? <laughs> yeah, pl please tell me if I have it wrong. <laughs> page 340? Okay, so uh, what do these two have in common? <laughs> one says nom nom nom, one says ho ho ho. Um, you know, they, they both love chocolate chip cookies. Um, and I, I kind of have been trying to work up this little idea of this, this talk about the science of chocolate chip cookies, because really, you know, this is much more fun to talk about than proteins. And invariably, someone comes up to you afterward and goes, I'm a vegetarian, and all you do is talk about meat. So I'm like, OK, I'll talk about something else. Um, so yeah, I started thinking about chocolate chip cookies, actually, uh, two years ago when a friend of mine, Hillary, gave a talk about her quest for the perfect chocolate chip cookie. And she talked about this New York Times article that had come out, where the reporter had like gone and talked to like a whole bunch of bakers in New York, and like try to come up with like a list of like what are all the really important variables in making really good chocolate chip cookies. And I started working on them. So I've like systematically, one by one, been making batches of cookies where like I, I weigh everything to the gram, except for like the vanilla extract, which I weigh to a like hundredth of a gram. Like keep everything exactly identical and then only vary one variable to see, well, what happens if I change this? So, you know, in the New York Times article and elsewhere online, they'll say things like, well, you know. If you cook things, you know, with more bread flour, they'll be chewier. Or hydration time, you know, you're supposed to like let your dough sit in your fridge for like 36 hours. Like supposedly, you know, it begins to get better if it like has a chance to rest for 12 hours, and 24 hours is even better, and like 36 hours even better. So it's like, well, does this really matter? And so the way to test this is to go, well, let's do an A and a B sample. Let's like hold everything else constant, vary one variable, and see if we can actually notice a difference. So let's start with temperature and cooking time. Um, I made these two cookies this morning. I have been resisting eating them all day long. Um, one of these was baked with the dough starting at room temperature, and the other was baked with the dough starting at fridge temperature. They're both 82 grams, identical weight, identical shape, and it turns out after baking them in the oven, they're exactly the identical diameter. 
well, minus, you know, plus or minus some error from them not being perfectly round. But, you know, for all practical purposes, I think I'd call these exactly the same size. Um, I'd say they're the same thickness, at least eyeballing it, at least. So the idea that the temperature of the dough does anything in terms of the shape of the cookie, well, I don't know. It's a good theory, but the data doesn't seem to support it. Um, now, maybe it's just the kind of cookie I'm making. Maybe it's only, you know, with certain kinds of recipes, it would work better. I mean, if I used only brown sugar, it would have spread out more. Um, but I certainly didn't notice any difference. Now, what I did notice um, is that the one that was started colder ended colder, which makes perfect sense. So I picked them on the same cookie sheet. They went in at the same time, kept that constant. Okay, yeah, my oven could have been warmer in one side than the other. It's possible, but not very likely. Um, so the one that actually finished... Um, well, the one that actually started with freezer temperature dough was actually like about 10 degrees colder in the center using a probe thermometer when I pulled it out. And I'm kind of curious, and I'll, you know, maybe afterwards we can like split these up and some guinea pigs can help determine if you can actually notice the difference. Um, I'm kind of curious if there might be like a textural difference where maybe it's got more moisture in it so it's chewier. Um, so more temperature stuff. Um, I stuck a lump of cookie dough on my toaster oven. Um, you can see there's a little white line sticking into the dough on the left side. That's actually a probe thermometer that's running into the cookie. So I'm measuring internal temperature of the dough as it cooks. Um, what's your model say about like what happens to cookie dough when you put it in the oven? Like what happens between that point and this point? Um, guesses? Water goes bye bye. That seems like a reasonable guess. Yeah. Um, where would the water be coming from? So the egg and the butter. OK, yeah. Um, other guesses? Comments? Yes, there is protein in flour. And I don't know if it denatures. I, I mean, it definitely breaks down. And that's where your Meyer reactions come from. So I don't know if denatures is the right word. See, this is where I wave my hands and go, I'm not a food scientist. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the egg protein would definitely do natural coagulate. Um, well, assuming it hasn't like been bound up with something else. Um, you mean like that? So this begins to happen right around 92 degrees Fahrenheit, in fact, which happens to line up really nicely with the melting temperature of butter. It's like, oh, wait a second, that makes sense. Then around 212 degrees, the outside of this cookie begins to set. You can actually kind of see, like, I mean, just looking at it, you can actually see the cookie dough, like, visibly changes the way it looks and, like, no longer is flowing. 212 <laughs> degrees makes a lot of sense, um, as being, of course, the temperature at which water starts to steam off. Um, a little bit later, um, using an infrared thermometer uh, to take surface temperature, the cookie begins to start turn light brown, 310 degrees being that Maillard reaction that I mentioned earlier, which is a protein and a simple sugar combine and then break down and form hundreds of compounds, some of, our, some of which are brown, some of which smell really good, and a few of which apparently give us cancer. <laughs> then around 356 degrees, it begins to turn even darker brown as another reaction occurs. This is the caramelization of sucrose. Um, don't mix up caramelization with melting, because like this took me like I don't know how many weeks to realize that like sugar melts at 367. Like it's a pure substance. You can calibrate your oven with it. Like it'll melt at 367. Um, and and caramelization is actually like a chemical dehydration of the molecule. And it breaks down, forms hundreds of compounds, some of which are brown, some of which we like, and some of which cause cancer. Um, and if you leave the cookie in there even longer, it turns even darker brown. And the reason for this is that these temperatures I'm mentioning are actually kind of rate of reaction things. They're not like instantaneously like the cookie turns brown. It's like, no, you give it more time or you get it hotter, that reaction picks up and more, more reaction occurs. And of course, just because I could, a little time lapse thing. So here's a visual proof of it. Um, it's kind of neat to actually just go make a batch of sugar cookies and say, hey, I'm going to bake these and see if I can observe a difference over time, or different temperatures. And sure enough, you can. Um, Here's proof that I actually really am insane enough to check the internal temperature of my cookies. Um, what's really surprising to me is that the chocolate chips themselves get to 170 plus degrees. And we all read things about, whoa, be careful with your chocolate. It burns you know, above 120 degrees. Like, it'll burn. I was like, well, no, it gets to 173, and it's still not burnt. So kind of an open question there. So the whole temperature and cooking time thing, you know, the one on the left being you know, essentially the idea is the same as this. Um, you know, it definitely makes a difference in the texture. Um, you know, there's something there, obviously. I mean, clearly. How about gluten level? Do you guys know what gluten is? So I can skip these slides. 
OK. So when you take something like, let's say you're going to make a chocolate cake for somebody's birthday, and you grab flour, and all you have is bread flour. Bread flour has a lot of those two peptides, and those two peptides happen to form um, gluten, which basically can then, as a molecule, link to itself and create sheets of the stuff and give you bread-like texture, which is good in bread, sucks in cake. Um, so the key thing to th keep in mind with things like gluten is that different, pro um, different types of flours have different levels of gluten in them. And the easiest way to control your gluten level is to, well, reduce the amount or increase the amount that's present when your ingredients you're working with. Um, so if you look at different um, recipes, you know, they'll call for different types of flour for this reason. Now, besides just varying the gluten that's actually present, you can do other things. Like gluten, you know, has a, you know, I should say water aids in the formation of gluten. So things that have water in them, you know, gluten can, can develop. Oil interferes with that development. So things that's got a lot of oil in it, well, the gluten won't actually form so well. Um, but the easiest way to control it is to actually just control the amount that's present. So this is where I did another one of these experiments. Um, in this case, you know, I made a whole batch of cookies, keeping absolutely everything identical as I could. And then I did um, an ABC test. So this is a test where essentially the person who's trying to, well, the person who I'm testing with, you know, I'll give them three cookies and I'll tell them two of these are identical. So if I imagine all of you getting a plate where you had three cookies, A, B, and C, and you were all asked to tell which one's different. Statistically speaking, if they're all identical, you'd have like 33% people guessing right. Right? Make sense? So we did this, actually. Um, and when it comes to gluten level, it's really obvious. Things that are made with like bread flour versus cake flour, like texture is different. Which one you prefer? Well, it's probably personal preference. I, mean, I personally, the bread flour one's a little bit too bread-like. AP flour versus cake flour? Eh, AP flour is probably fine. Um, but you can definitely notice a difference. So this idea about gluten level on cookies, definitely important. How about hydration time? So I did the exact same test, the ABC test, where I made one batch, and then I let it rest for 36 hours. I made a second batch. I put it in the fridge, and I let it rest for one hour, long enough that the dough got cold, but not so long that it would have actually had any time to hydrate. So I know that the variable of, of starting temperature not being a, a difference there. And we tested this. Um, and well, it was a group of 18 people, so it's possible that you know, it wasn't large enough sample size. But really, statistically speaking, 33% got it right. So given that all things were held constant as much as I could, you know, people weren't able to tell the difference between the batch that was held for 36 hours and that, the one that wasn't. So as far as I can tell, hydration level doesn't seem to actually matter, which is kind of interesting. Because you got you know, this New York Times article, all these like, really well-known bakers in New York who are saying, yes, hydration time is the key to a good cookie. And yet when you test it, well, at least when I tested it, no one can even tell the difference. So again, another case where you have your theory, you get some data, maybe it lines up, maybe it doesn't. There are some more variables. Um, butter versus oil, amount of water present. Um, sugar, crispier versus chewier. Um, I'm still working through some of these. So I don't really have answers on these yet. Um, but just to give you an idea, like you know, there are a lot of different things you can kind of play with and take this approach into the kitchen. So I'd said this a few minutes ago, um, kind of the gluten model. Um, yeah? Um, well, the egg yolks have fat, and the egg whites don't. So if you're talking about you know, water versus fat content, you're going to impact that. So impact gluten level, you'll impact you know, how much fat there is in flat being pliable and water steaming out and being dry, and the crispier, at least in theory. Um, so I guess kind of in sum summary, um, you know, we start by saying that models need data. You can have your theories, but without data, you don't really know if your models are accurate or not. We can, talk, we can talk about how good those models are. Um, you know, some models can be useful. You know, for day in and day out things when you walk into a kitchen, following a recipe is probably fine until something goes wrong and it's not quite working the way you want it to work or you know, maybe you want to do something new and different, in which case having a better model will help you come up with better ideas. And then kind of finally there's this, this quote that I think really sums it up really nicely. Um, yeah, in theory, you know, the world is a beautiful, simple place, but in reality, it is a noisy, noisy world. There's lots of stuff in the data that never seems to line up quite right. Um, no matter how good your model is, it's never going to predict everything. But realize that a better model will help you do better predictions, so the delta and the error is going to go down as you get better. So with that, um, I'm happy to take questions. And um, 
Maybe we can split these cookies up and see if, well, see if they're delicious, I guess. I don't actually have three of them to do a proper ABC test. Um, so yeah, thanks. OK, questions? Right. <laughs> I knew I was forgetting something. Sign up sheets. Damn it, I forgot them. Um, but what? Ah, yes, OK. And look, there's a pencil handily enough. <laughs> you guys think of everything. Um, so if you, if you want to uh, be on my mailing list, basically it means that you know, maybe a few times a year I'll send out interesting email about, hey, here's how to get the perfect cookie. Or next time I'm in the area giving a talk, you know, I'll say, hey, I'm giving a talk. Um, if you want, just give me your email address on here, and then I'll pick it up afterward. Um, so you had a question. I'm sorry? Gluten. It's a poison for your body. Um, gluten intolerance. Um, well, I mean, certainly there are people whose bodies can't handle gluten. I mean, celiac disease would be primary. Um, and you're talking probably more generically about like inflammation um, from gluten. I don't know. You know? Um, it would kind of make some sense, but I mean, it's the same thing with peanut allergies, right? It's like, I'm not quite sure where you're going with. Food's complicated. It's actually kind of one of the surprising insights for me after having worked on the book. Here it is 2010, and yet still, there's so much we don't know about the way food works, the way our body handles it from a nutritional point of view, the way it cooks. Like, there's just so many unknowns. So. Yeah, if you actually find anything that's specific on that, I'd love to learn more. Overmixing things is almost always have to do with gluten level. You don't want to quote unquote develop the gluten. So if you're like say making blueberry muffins and you use all purpose flour, um, you want your muffins to be like nice and crumbly so you know you take a muffin and tear it like it doesn't stretch. Whereas if you cuz well, you could you could you could get that. Think about french bread where it's like it's actually like elastic, right? It doesn't tear, like it's got this kind of stretchiness to it. That's from gluten. So if you're using all-purpose flour and you're making blueberry muffins and like you beat, you know, beat it a lot, like you're gonna you're gonna take those different um, peptides and it will allow them to form them form their cross links and allow them to, to create that structure that is that gluten that gives it that elastic property. Um, alternatively, you could use low gluten flour. Alternatively, you could do something that interferes with the ability of the gluten to link together. So like a lot of oil, for example, would do that. So you'll see actually some cakes will call for like flour and then say, beat it like on high for like three minutes. And like you're thinking, well, this makes no sense. I'm always told not to develop the gluten. But if you start looking at it, it also has like a cup of oil or something like in there that's like interfering with the gluten from forming. Um, so that's generally why you're told and you be careful not to overbeat your batters. It's really those cases where you don't want the elastic quality, where you have enough gluten present and you don't have anything that's going to inhibit the formation of that gluten. So in the back, yeah. Cooking fish. Um, sous vide actually is really, really good for fish. Um, if you take a look at salmon, like, you know how salmon, when you overcook it, it gets that dry sandpapery texture? Like, you don't get that with sous vide because that's the other protein setting. If you cook it low enough, um, I, I actually find personally that poaching salmon, um, or even just like olive oil, if you just take olive oil and put your fish in, if you get a small enough container and you, your fish like, is large enough, like, you, you don't even need that much olive oil. Um, and just like bake it at a low temperature. Use a probe thermometer, because the thing to keep in mind is it's not the temperature of the environment, it's not how long it's in the oven, it's the temperature of the fish itself that matters. And so if you put a probe thermometer in it that has an alarm on it and set it to go off, like I don't know, in the case of fish, maybe 130 degrees, in the case of salmon, and it set it to go off at 130, and you actually might want to be a little smart about it and say, well, there's gonna be a little carryover, because like the outside will be hotter than the middle if you're doing your oven. So maybe set your alarm to like 125 and pull it out, and like realize you're gonna have a five degree carryover. Um, so the, the key with fish really is don't get it too hot. I mean, that, that's really what basically ruins fish. How do you determine what temperature for cooking sous vide stuff? Um, probably the fastest answer I can give you is to Google Douglas Baldwin, or actually just Google sous vide guide. There's a mathematician at the University of Colorado who's calculated like all the times 
for proper pasteurization at all the temperatures for like all the different kinds of proteins. So you'll say like eggs hold at 62 degrees Celsius for 45 minutes, and like it's good. Um, that's probably the easiest answer. Um, um, I think there's another question a minute ago over there somewhere. You just raise your hand because I said that. Oh, I think it's her. Go ahead. Water temperature and yeast. You know, I did. A, there's one thing that surprised me. Um, you're always told not to proof your yeast in too hot of water, and like. I'm thinking about this, and I'm looking at the yeast temperatures and the food safety stuff, and it's like, well, they, they essentially don't die until hotter temperatures, hotter than your tap water. And so I actually took some yeast, took my tap water, set my tap to like full hot, like 130 degrees in my case. It was actually, no, it's like 125 degrees in my case, I think. And the yeast didn't die, and it still was able to do its thing. Well, um, th th this would be one of these classic examples, especially, with, let's say, with family dynamics in the picture, where it's like, well, let's do an experiment and just see what we can learn. Um, I can tell you that temperature that the yeast is allowed to actually rise at will impact the, the flavor of the bread, because you get two different compounds. There's acetic acid, and there's, quick, somebody look in chapter five to remind me. Um, there's one other thing, um, and these two things essentially like the ideal temperature for your dough is like 75 to like 80 degrees Fahrenheit, too hot or too cold, like it won't do quite the right thing. But that's for the rise of the dough. If you're just proofing the yeast, you're putting the yeast in hot water, I don't think it should matter that much. But maybe, you know, I'm not a baker, maybe he's got, he's onto something, or maybe there's something else going on in the environment that, it, you know, is ancillary to these. Uh, essentially, how has knowing food science impacted my enjoyment of dinner? Um, it's certainly made it faster for me to cook certain things and be comfortable going, yes, this is safe, or no, it's not. Um, the other thing that's kind of sad is I have a hard time ordering salmon sushi versus tuna sushi, now that I know the differences between like tuna and salmon from a food safety point of view, which is really bad because, you know, tuna, well, our fisheries are kind of screwed. It's a whole other conversation. Um, you know, I, I think I'd probably say it, it would be like somebody who... Um, knows how to play piano really well, being able to still enjoy hearing somebody else play the piano. I mean, for me, the food science is kind of fun to talk about, but at the end of the day, for me, it's really about community, about having friends over and like having a good time together. And so in some ways, the food science just frees me up from not worrying about burning the dinner while I do that. So it's not like I'm looking at it from a technical point of view, wanting it to be perfect. It's just like, well, I'm kind of curious how stuff works. So yeah, I don't think I would say it's impacted me too much in that regard, but it's a good question. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that there are things other than the original flour that you want that could be. Oh, sure. Um, well, I mean, it still gives you, there's lots of starches there. It still gives you a structure. I mean, it's still able to trap air bubbles. I mean, if you try to make like a pumpkin, there's a pumpkin cake in the book. If you remove the flour, like, you'd probably just get like a pumpkin custard. Like, there wouldn't be any, I mean, it wouldn't make any sense. Um, yeah, it's, it's just that elastic quality of the gluten. Um, let's take like maybe two more questions, and then um, I'm happy to hang around afterward and you know answer questions for longer. <laughs> These days, it feels like I'm uh, working on the book, kind of pretty much full time. Um, I do tech startup stuff in the Boston area. Mm -hmm. Do you find yourself the notion of the science, like we need exactly three fourths of a cup of sugar plus two two more tablespoons, whatever it is? So do you find yourself really interested? You're like, no, I better just know that this is. And you're just speaking for yourself and not giving any clear answer. Yep. Um, so I'm going to give you a two part answer. 
Um, that was a very kind of long question. Yeah, sorry. Uh, that's fine. Um, the first part of the answer is um, people think that baking is harder than cooking, kind of generically. I mean, people agree? Yeah. Okay. I actually, oh, I like that people are saying no. And the reason for this is actually, that to me, the difference between baking and cooking from a difficulty point of view is really about error tolerance. It's like if you're making like a loaf of bread and you're off by 10% in your hydration level, it's not going to work. If you're making like steak fajitas and you're off by 10% in your onion level, it's going to be delicious. You know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so it doesn't really come down to like so much about being precise as it is about having like, kind of the right ratios of things. And if your ratios get too far out of whack, they s your end product starts being not as good. And like how not as good and how out of whack they are, you know, that, that's very subjective. Um, so if your mom's like looking at stuff, kind of throwing stuff into a bowl, that's actually um, an entirely separate thing than kind of that precision of, of error measurement. Um, and this is where I'm going to say, see page eight and nine of the book for the interview with um, Brian Wansink, who looks at different types of cooks. Um, so most of us think of there being like bakes, bakers and cookers, cooks, right? Why is it not symmetric? Why is it not cookers? Bakers and cooks. Um, but what he actually found was there were five broad types of people that cook. And one of them is this innovative type who like will look at a couple of recipes and like go, oh, that's interesting, and then walk into the kitchen, like throw stuff into the pan, like, and it comes out delicious. Um, for that kind of person, like, like recipes are practically the worst thing. Um, there's another type where it's very traditional, like they want to follow a recipe exactly. And if there's one ingredient missing, like they don't know what to do. Um, that's kind of the other extreme. And then there's two or three other like types. There's actually three types in this typology. They're kind of like in between, where it's like, yeah, they follow the recipe, but maybe for them, you know, it's about health, and like they're much more interested in like what the nutrients do for their body. Or maybe it's somebody who's like essentially trying to show off by cooking. Like, like the person like does the crazy like food thing, or like grills things like kind of in a you know hey, look at me kind of way. Like all the, think about all the food TV, like reality TV shows, you know, Boy Meets Girl or like all those things. Like um, there's kind of that set of things in there as well. So it sounds like your mom's probably in the innovative category. Um, but yeah, cool. So I will be around um, afterwards to answer more questions and thanks for coming out.